Hello, my name is Van de Keizer, and this is a video on imaging of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. It's part of a series of videos on various toxic metabolic brain disorders, but hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is probably the most frequent one of those, and that's why I decided to make a presentation on this topic alone, so I can do it in a lot of detail. So let's get started with a short introduction, and let's start with a case. This is a three-month-old boy who was brought to the emergency room after being found by his parents in his cradle, not responsive, lying face down. In the emergency room, an unenhanced CT of the brain was ordered, and this is what uh, these are the images. And they were a bit difficult. I was called by the resident on call uh to look at them uh together and we were a bit unsure when we look at the images over here on the left side the frontal parietal lobes we see nothing out of the ordinary we see uh normal sulci uh, we see gray white matter differentiation that is still preserved centrally in the brain we can still see the basal ganglia and the thalami and what is a bit strange or the temporal lobes which seem to have a diminished or an absent uh, differentiation of the gray white matter um, so this was a bit bizarre we were pretty unsure on whether or not we had to call this we were thinking could this be some kind of artifact because this is a low dose ct the quality is not very high uh, the images are a bit pixely a bit noisy so we decided that we were unsure about whether or not this represented hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And the patient received, because we were unsure, an MRI. And on MRI, the fusion-weighted images were performed. And now the diagnosis is, I believe, very clear. We see a diffuse bilateral cortical diffusion restriction uh, about diffuse, we see it mainly in the watershed areas. The central brain areas are still preserved, and this is a pattern that we can see in, that we can see in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And I'm going to talk about those patterns a bit later. But for now, let's just say that although the CT was a bit dubious, MRI is clear, and the final diagnosis is of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Now, what exactly is hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy? In uh, the term hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, we have three words, hypoxic, ischemic, and encephalopathy. Hypoxic means there's a shortage of oxygen in the blood. It means that the supply of oxygen is diminished. So apparently, oxygen does not reach the lungs uh, or cannot go from the lungs to the rest of the body. So basically, for instance, because the patient is drowning or has drowned uh, or has asphyxiated for one reason or another. The second term is ischemic. And what is ischemia? Ischemia is basically a shortage of blood flow to the brain. In this case, can be any part of the body, but in this case, we're talking about the brain. In an acute ischemic stroke, this will be a very local occurrence. Uh, we will have a blood clot somewhere in an uh, artery of the brain causing a region, the region that is supplied by that artery that has a shortage of blood, and that will cause an ischemic infarction. In hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, the entire brain does not receive enough blood. And this is generally seen when patients have uh, a cardiac failure, uh, a cardiac arrest, and the heart no longer pumps blood to the brain and the rest of the body. And the result of hip this hypoxic ischemic event is an encephalopathy, which literally means disease of the brain, a sick brain. So encephalopathy is basically the resultant brain dysfunction. So hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy can occur at all ages and all age groups, but the causes will differ. So in neonates, uh, hypoxic ischemic events are generally the result of perinatal asphyxia, which can have a lot of different causes, uh, difficult childbirth, um, strangulation by an umbilical cord, and so on and so on. 
In children, the main causes are asphyxia and drowning. And in adult patients, the main reason is a cardiac arrest. So hypoxia and ischemia, is there a difference? And does the difference matter? Well, of course, there's a difference. There are two different things, but they're, str they're um, strongly uh, related to one another. Uh, if you were to suffer a pure hypoxia, that's basically better than an ischemia because for some reason or another, neurons actually tolerate pure hypoxia a lot better than ischemia. The reason is a bit unclear, but it might have to do with the fact that the blood flow is in a situation of pure hypoxia still preserved, and there is influx possible of nutrients and removal of toxins and catabolites, like for instance, lactate. Uh, but a pure hypoxia is uncommon because in a situation of severe and prolonged systemic hypoxia, the heart will also suffer, and cardiac hypoxia will lead to a decreased cardiac output, a failure of the cardiac uh, function, and an overall systemic hypoperfusion leading to general brain ischemia. So the distinction is a bit artificial or a bit academic, because in reality, the two often occur uh, simultaneously, although the cause might be different. So what is the pathophysiology on a cellular, ne uh, cellular level of hypoxia ischemia? What happens to the brain cells? And this is important to understand what we're looking at on imaging. So say you suffer a generalized hypoxic ischemic event. What will happen in the neurons? Uh, well, you need oxygen for the production of ATP. And ATP, as you know, is basically the fuel of the cells of our body, adenosine triphosphate, a very important molecule. If you know, if you don't have ATP or your cells no longer have ATP, well, then you will get failure of several membrane pumps. And in the neurons, we have a lot of membrane pumps. The most important one is probably the ATP-dependent uh, sodium-potassium pump. This will no longer function, and the result is a massive influx in neurons of sodium ions. And because uh, uh, homeostasis will try to maintain osmotic gradients, this influx of sodium ions will be accompanied with a massive influx of water molecules in an attempt to restore the osmotic gradient uh, along the brain cells. And this giant accumulation of water molecules and neurons will lead to swelling of neurons. So our cells will swell. And basically, that's what we see when we look at an MRI image and we see diffusion restriction in a patient with an ischemic stroke or hypoxic ischemic event. We're basically looking at those swollen cells. Uh, but that's not the only thing that happens. What happens next? So we have a massive influx of sodium ions into neurons. Uh, this will lead to a massive depolarization of uh, axons and a release of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. Glutamate will bind to postsynaptic NMDA receptors and cause a massive influx of calcium ions in postsynaptic neurons. And this massive influx of calcium will activate several cytotoxic cell processes. And the final result of this entire cascade is necrotic cell death. And basically, that's not what we're looking at when we're looking at diffusion restriction in the brain. But the processes are strongly correlated, so it's basically a bit the same. Keep in mind that when we're talking about hypoxic ischemic uh, events, Diffusion restriction can be uh, equalized with necrotic cell death, but that will not be true for every toxic metabolic disease out there that is associated with diffusion restriction. Uh, but it is true for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Now, which brain regions will suffer the most in uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy? Well, self-evidently, the cause of brain damage and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is lack of oxygen. And because there's lack of oxygen, uh, basically we no longer have uh, fuel, no longer energy 
in uh, the brain cells. So basically those brain regions that need the most energy will suffer the most. And because um, glutamate excitotoxicity is responsible for or leads to necrotic cell death, also the regions with the highest concentrations of glutamate receptors will suffer the most. And in practice, that is the gray matter. So gray matter structures will suffer the most. Uh, basically, uh, most vulnerable are the cerebral cortex and the basal ganglia. The thalamus can be involved, but is, can also be spared, so it's not always involved. Um, on the other hand, so you can see basal ganglia and thalamic involvement, but you will rarely see just thalamic involvement without basal ganglia involvement. And other structures that are very vulnerable are the hippocampus, uh, which is also a gray matter structure, and the cerebellum. In older children and adults, the cerebellum is often spared in neonatal uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. The reason for that is a bit unclear, but it probably has to do with the immaturity of the Purkinje cells at that stage of development. Now, imaging. When a patient suffers a cardiac arrest, or a patient is found uh, after a hanging or a drowning, he's brought to the emergency room, and the first imaging study to be performed is generally CT. So what can we see on CT images in patients with a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or after a hypoxic ischemic event? This is a four-year-old uh, male patient, a four-year-old boy, who suffered a severe hemorrhagic shock after an elective tonsillectomy. The patient became comatose um, and received an enhanced CT of the brain. And what do we see here? Well, it's a very impressive, uh, these are very impressive images. We see diffuse edema of the supratentorial brain. We see that the brain parenchyma is completely hypodense. We can no longer see a gray-white matter differentiation, so everything is hypodense. There's complete obscuration of the gray-white matter uh, demarcation, and also the basal ganglia can no longer be delineated. Uh, also notice that there is complete sulcal effacement, so we can no longer distinguish separate sulci uh, because of the brain swelling and the mass effect. And also the ventricles are strongly compressed because of the brain swelling and the mass effect. When we look at these images, on which we also see part of the posterior fossa, we see that the supratentorial brain is very hypodense due to massive diffuse brain edema, but the cerebellum is still bright. And this is called the white cerebellum sign. The white cerebellum sign, it's a bit unclear, what's uh, the exact cause of the white cerebellum sign. It's not always present because as said, the cerebellum can also be involved in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, especially in older children and adults. Uh, but sometimes you can see it. And the reason is a bit unclear. It can be that the cerebellum is spared, is not involved, and it just looks bright relative to the very hypodense supratentorial brain parenchyma, and there are some theories uh, that say that it is because of distended cerebellar veins and vessels uh, that these lead to a somewhat increased in density of the cerebellum. Well, the reason is not that important. Just remember that it is a sign you can see in diffuse supratentorial brain edema. And these are some of the signs, sulcal effacement, narrowing of the ventricles, hypodensity of the brain parenchyma without gray-white matter differentiation, and here we have the bright cerebellum sign. This is another patient with a bright cerebellum sign. Uh, it's also a very nice illustration. We see that the supratentorial brain parenchyma is a very hypodent. We cannot distinguish a gray-white matter differentiation. And here is the cerebellum on axial slices. And here is a very bright cerebellum on sagittal slices. So another example of the bright or white cerebellum sign. Now, these are extreme cases. Um, not all cases are that extreme, although this one still is. This is a 65-year-old male patient who suffered a cardiac arrest. And these are CT images uh, performed in the acute or subacute phase. And what do we see? We once again see a swollen brain. There is complete sulcal effacement. Uh, 
um, we see no gray-white matter uh, differentiation anymore uh, over here, and everything looks rather hyperdense, but over here the cortex is hypodense. Also notice that the basal ganglia are pretty hypodense, a bit patchy, and we see a lot of perisylvian uh, cortical structures that are hypodense compared to a hyperdense white matter. So basically, what we see in this patient is a bit of the reversal of the normal situation. In a normal situation, the cortex will be more uh, hyperdense than, than the white matter. Here, the cortex has become hypodense and white matter hyperdense. This is called the CT reversal sign. Gray matter becoming hypodense and white matter becoming hyperdense. And the reason for that is probably because the cortex, as uh, Eudimetrius, uh, it becomes hypodense and white matter becomes hyperdense due to the presence of distended or thrombosed medullary veins in the brain parenchyma. That's the theory. This is a more subtle case. This is also a patient with a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And what is most conspicuous here is, while the brain parenchyma is not as hypodense as in the previous cases, uh, but we see complete sulcal effacement, that's definitely the case, and also narrowing of the ventricles, so there definitely is brain swelling present in this patient. Uh, we can still make some distinction between the gray matter and the white matter, but everything looks a bit blurry. It's like the entire brain is blurring to achieve a homogeneous density, but simply hasn't gotten there yet. So also an example of what a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy can look like on CT, but a bit more subtle than the previous cases. And if you were to work too fast or you don't have a lot of experience yet, it might be something that gets overlooked if you are not careful uh, because the density changes are not as in your face as in the previous cases. And finally, a last example of a patient with a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy do you see anything out of the ordinary? Well, if you say you do, you're lying. Um, well, maybe I'm exaggerating, but this is a presentation on, on hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. We can now start scrutinizing these images, because have some doubts about whether or not the gray-white matter differentiation is a bit too blurry or not. But in daily practice, when you're confronted with this image and you have a huge case load, you'll probably just say, well, no, at the, at the first glance, this looks okay. Uh, I can doubt a little bit, but you, you wouldn't call this. Uh, I definitely wouldn't. So I'd say that this is a negative CT, and that's nothing to be ashamed of not calling it when uh, the clinical suspicion is very high, because CT can be negative in the acute phase. So um, CT has a high positive predictive value uh, when it's uh, when you see abnormalities. Well, okay, the patient will have hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, but a negative CT doesn't mean anything. The patient can still have very severe brain damage. So let's summarize uh, the things we have seen. We have seen an in-your-face case like this one, diffuse brain edema, brain completely swollen and hypodense. We have seen a CT reversal sign, uh, something everybody would call pathological as well. Then we have seen this case, which is a bit more subtle and in which basically there is some discrete blurring of the gray-white matter and sulcal effacement. And lastly, we have a negative case. But all these patients have severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And unfortunately, all these patients have also died. So CT can do anything. And this, I already said, it has a very good positive predictive value, but a low negative predictive value. So basically, CT rules in, but CT does not rule out. And keep that in mind. Um, what is something else we can see on an unenhanced CT of the brain? Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Or is there... Uh, when you look at these images, you might say, well, it looks pretty hyperdense, yeah? The basal cisterns are filled with hyperdense material. And also here in the sylvian fissures, we see hyperdensities and even along the cerebral convexities and here along the phalx. Is this subarachnoid hemorrhage? Well, no, it isn't. Uh, this is the previous patient. If we magnify this a bit and these images become very pixely when they're magnified like this, 
but I like doing it. It looks like a subparanoid hemorrhage, except it isn't. This is another patient. It's a bit similar, but if we zoom in here, we can see that the hyperdensities here actually correspond to the middle cerebral arteries. And everything we're looking at that looks so hyperdense are basically vascular structures. And this is no true subarachnoid hemorrhage. No, this is a pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage, something that can be seen in patients with a diffuse brain edema, as in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And this is the same patient as the previous one. And look, this is the swollen hypodense brain. And look at the vascular structures. They're all very hyperdense. Why is that? Well, the theory is that this is caused by distension, congestion, and or thrombosis of the intracranial vessels in a patient with global and severe brain edema. And this hyperdensity is further accentuated by the fact that the surrounding brain parenchyma has become very hypodense due to the presence of massive brain edema. Also note is that in this patient, the cerebellum is also involved, looks uh, very hypodense and swollen just as much as the supratentorial brain. So the bright cerebellum sign is definitely not present in each and every patient with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And let's go back to the previous patient with the pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage and compare this with an image a couple of days earlier. So here we can see that the brain, so this was on day one, this is day five, we can see that the brain has become very hypodense and swollen compared to the original examination. The patient has developed a so-called pseudo uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage sign due to distended, swollen, congested, and or thrombosed vessels. But also look at the basal cisterns. Over here, there may be a bit more narrowed than you'd expect in a normal situation. But here, they are completely effaced. And this is something that we see in a patient with transtentorial herniation. So herniation of the supratentorial brain parenchyma through the tentorial notch compressing the mesencephalon and the brain stem. And this is something you also have to look for in a patient with brain edema, signs of herniation. And the herniation will generally go downward. So you will have transtentorial herniation and even possible tonsillar herniation. Now let's talk about the, MR, uh, the MRI characteristics of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. What are those? Uh, this is the first case, the case we started with. And on CT, we were a bit unsure about whether or not this was something. And in retrospect, but it's always easy in retrospect. In retrospect, we would have been right if we would have had the guts to call it uh, because this was diffusion restricted cortical edema. But we are doubting here. But on MRI, on the diffusion weighted images, there is no room for doubt. We see diffusion restriction, and uh, it's a very clear case. Uh, and the cerebral cortex. So here there was some doubt and there it is clear. And the diffusion weighted images are the main sequence when it comes to the diagnosis of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and acute phase. Look at the other sequences in this little boy. On the inversion recovery T1 weighted images, we see no abnormalities. This is a child of three months old. So we see signs of myelination, uh, some hyperintense white matter changes in the region of the corto corticospinal tract, the pericentral region. That's completely normal at this stage. On T2, well, that's a bit more difficult because it's a very young child. I do a lot of pediatric neuroradiology, and I would say this doesn't really look right, what I'm looking at here, the signal in the white matter but it's rather subtle and you probably need a bit of experience to really see it. Yeah, and at the moment I can call myself pretty experienced at pediatric neuroradiology, but I am not sure if I would have uh, called this on T2, let's say five years ago when I didn't have that much experience. So let's say T2 looks positive to me, but it's a bit experience dependent, I believe, and it's more subtle and not that easy. The diffusion weighted images, on the other hand, they are clearly abnormal. And why? Uh, because some of you might wonder, well, why do you think this T2 weighted image is abnormal? Look at the cortex, for instance, over here. 
no, uh, normally the cortex should be hypo intense, as we can see here. But here we see that the cortex looks as if it's disappearing or thinning. We also see that over here in the frontal lobe on the left side, for instance, but also on the right to a lesser extent. And this is something that bothers me when I look at these images. Mainly here, this uh, right occipital region looks very abnormal to me. But once again, this is still, you know, uh, even if you were to call it, the question is, what would you call it? And on diffusion, it's clear. This is cytotoxic cortical edema. And it's not just in children that the diffusion weighted images are the most useful sequence in the acute phase. Uh, so during the first couple of days of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, but also in adults. When you look at the flare images, well, pathology and uh, the abnormalities in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy are often symmetrical or generally symmetrical, and that can make it quite difficult. These flare images also look abnormal to me, but to someone with uh, a bit less experience, this can be very difficult to interpret these as uh, normal or abnormal. So let's go for not sure. Looks like the signal is a bit increased in the basal ganglia and the cortex. It looks maybe a bit swollen, but I'm really having my doubts on whether this is real or not. Then on the diffusion weighted images, Chang, no doubt possible. Diffusion restriction in the basal ganglia, somewhat in the thalami on both sides, and also in the cerebral cortex on both sides, confirmed by diffusion weighted images, which sh show most diffusion restriction in the basal ganglia and in the medial occipital cortex. So once again, diffusion weighted images are clearly positive. Uh, so let's conclude that diffusion weighted images are the most sensitive sequence for the detection of an acute hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And that would be during the first couple of days after the hypoxic ischemic event. And why is hypoxic ischemic or, or why is hypoxic ischemic damage so nicely visible on uh, diffusion weighted images? Well, that has to do with the pathophysiology of hypoxic ischemic uh, injury. Uh, we explain that in the introduction, basically a hypoxic ischemic event will lead to swelling of the neurons. And this is a normal situation. This is what a normal brain looks like. We have cells. And this, the space between the cells is called the intercellular space. Um, it's quite a lot of space there. And there's a lot of space for water molecules to diffuse around. So basically, there is free, well, it's not completely free, but the diffusion of water molecules in the intercellular spaces is possible without a lot of obstructions. Now, what happens when these cells start swelling because of a lack of oxygen and failure of the sodium potassium pumps, we get cellular swelling and the intercellular spaces will narrow, limiting the diffusion of water molecules. And the result is, of course, literally a restriction of diffusion and diffusion restriction is something we can see on diffusion weighted images. So that explains why diffusion weighted images are so sensitive for the detection of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in the acute phase. On this slide, you see six patients with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And when you look at the location of the abnormalities, you will see that these differ. So there are um, the brain structures that are most vulnerable to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or the basal ganglia and the cerebral cortex. But nevertheless, we can see several different patterns. And now I'm going to show you the different patterns that can be observed. So what are those? Let's first give them a name. We have the diffuse cortical pattern, which is basically a pattern of total brain in, uh, involvement. So basically the total cerebral cortex and the basal ganglia, and often the cerebellum will also be involved. Then we have the pyrrolandic and medio occipital pattern, a pattern in which of the brain cortical structures, mainly the pericentral region and the medial part of the occipital lobe are involved. Then we have the basal ganglia only pattern, which is pretty self-evident. We have the watershed pattern and we have a white matter pattern. That's correct, a white matter pattern. Now let's look at some examples. 
This is a patient with a diffuse cortical pattern, and I believe it's pretty clear why this is a diffuse cortical pattern. The entire cortex, or almost the entire cortex, is involved symmetrical bilaterally. There is also involvement of the basal ganglia, but look at the thalamus. Thalamus is not involved. And also the cerebellum, which is not always the case, but in this patient it is. So this is a diffuse cortical pattern. And also notice that there is no sparing of the periodolandic and the medial occipital cortex. So these are also involved in this patient. Then this is a periodolandic and medial occipital pattern. I am now showing you the ADC maps because sometimes the abnormalities are more clear on the ADC map than on the actual diffusion weighted images. And where do we see? diffusion restriction in the periodolandic cortex on both sides, in the medial occipital cortex, and in this patient also in the basal ganglia, including the thalamus. But notice that the rest of the supratentorial cerebral cortex is not involved. It's uh, limited to the periodolandic and medial occipital cortex. And what is a possible explanation for this? Well, this was probably a very severe hypoxic ischemic event that didn't last that long. That's just a theory behind these different patterns. So what are the brain, so what are the cortical structures that need the most energy? Well, the periodolandic cortex, because it is uh, responsible for a primary motor and sensory function, and that requires a lot of energy. And the primary visual cortex, because the primary visual cortex also needs a lot of energy because we are constantly looking, so it's constantly active, so it needs a lot of energy, and the basal ganglia do as well. So this was a very severe event. Um, the cortical structures that need a lot of energy suffered greatly and have become diffusion restrictive, but it didn't took that long, so the rest of the brain is preserved. That's the theory behind the pattern. I don't know if it's completely correct because it's difficult to prove, but that's the theory. Then we have the basal ganglia pattern, and the basal ganglia pattern, only basal ganglia are involved in this case also with the thalamus, but the rest of the cerebral cortex looks spared in this patient. The basal ganglia only pattern is only seen in a minority of patients and about 5% of patients with a hypoxic ischemic event. But if only basal ganglia are involved, the prognosis tends to be better than in the other patterns we have seen. Then we have the watershed pattern, and this is an example in a neonate. And what is the watershed pattern? Well, the name kind of says it. The diffusion restriction is mainly located in the watershed areas of the brain. And the central brain regions, or the regions needing a lot of energy, such as the periodolandic region, such as the medial occipital cortex, and the basal ganglia are spared. Also notice that despite the fact that the abnormalities are very apparent on diffusion-weighted images, they cannot be seen, uh, not even if we know it, although if you know it, you can always say, well, maybe over here, but never mind that. The T2 doesn't look uh, abnormal at the first glance, but the diffusion clearly is. So what's the theory behind the watershed pattern? This was probably... Uh, hypoxic ischemic event, moderate hypoxic ischemic event uh, that took a while. So there was time for blood to get shunted from not so important brain regions to very important brain regions in an attempt to save the important brain regions. And what are important brain regions? Well, the periodolandic cortex, the medial occipital cortex, and the basal ganglia. And this is another example of a child with a medio, uh, with a watershed pattern. So we see that the periodolandic cortex is spared. The medial occipital cortex is also spared. There is some diffusion restriction here and there, but it's relatively preserved. And the basal ganglia are as well. Then lastly, we also have a white matter pattern. Um, and when it comes to the white matter pattern, this is rarely something that you will see on an MRI performed on the first day of a hypoxic ischemic event, but generally a finding that is seen on MRIs performed in a later phase. And the theory is that we are looking at diffuse cytotoxic edema of the white matter, 
probably reflecting acute Valerian degeneration of the white matter secondary to diffuse cortical damage. So the cortex is probably completely involved in this patient, but has already normalized on the ADC map. And diffusion changes will normalize on ADC after about seven to 10 days. And in the second stage, we will get degeneration, acute or leading de degeneration of the white matter. These are the diffusion white uh, weighted images, and these are the ADC maps. And I believe the ADC maps speak for themselves. Yeah, the white matter is completely dark or completely black. So this, this, these are some of the patterns or the most important patterns that can be seen in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So keep an open mind. I think most people will immediately or will be familiar with the total pattern, which is also the most frequent. But uh, don't, be, uh, don't be in doubt when you see a watershed pattern. If it's the first time you see it and you don't know that it is possible, it might have you scratching your head, but it is something you can see in a hypoxic ischemic event. So what are some of the pitfalls in evaluating MRIs in patients with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy? Well, the first one would definitely be the fact that the abnormalities are perfectly symmetrical, which can make evaluation sometimes difficult. Uh, this is the diffusion-weighted image in a patient with acute hypoxic uh, encephalopathy. And if I were to show this to you without giving you any information and just tell you one, do you see an abnormality? The chances are that you would say, well, no, at a first glance, I don't, because we are used to look for asymmetries. Um, I have witnessed uh, multidisciplinary meetings in which expert neuroradiologists, when suddenly confronted out of the blue with uh, diffusion-weighted images of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, calling them negative, because, well, at the first glance, everything looks symmetrical and you don't see anything that jumps out. So be very careful. Eh? The pathology is symmetrical and it can be overlooked even by the best neuroradiologist. So what is something I often do when in doubt? I pull out an examination of a random other patient and compare the diffusion weighted images, preferably scanned at the same machine. It's the oldest trick in the book but it has helped me on many different okay occasions. And if we compare it, we can see that the cerebral cortex looks a bit more swollen and hyper intense compared to this random other patient. Uh, also look at your ADC map because the ADC map to me is often more clear than the diffusion weighted images. And here we see that the cortex is hypo intense uh, basically anywhere, also the basal ganglia a little bit um, in this patient. But you can, all, you can, of course, have the same problem with the ADC map as with the diffusion-weighted images. And if you have that problem, well, just compare it with a random other patient. This is the patient with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. The cortex is completely somewhat thickened and dark on the ADC map. And this is a random other patient well, in a random other patient, it, it's basically quite difficult to see the difference between the cortex and the white matter on the ADC map. It all looks a bit the same grayish. So if you can see your cortex as pitch dark uh, as in this patient, it must be cortical diffusion restriction. Um, then another pitfall you might have is that the ADC map. So I, I like to look at the ADC map. I find it often more convincing than diffusion weighted images, but the ADC map tends to normalize after about seven to 10 days. And why is that? Because those swollen cells are dying. And when they die, they, how to say that, they rupture. And basically the, um, the, the, the space and the intercellular space is, opens up again and diffusion of water molecules is once again possible. So we have less and less and less diffusion restriction. And sometimes you can still see some abnormalities on the diffusion weighted image, but these more likely reflect some kind of T2 shine true. Don't let this here confuse you. This was a tiny infarction that was actually secondary to a ventricle drain placement. And you can see some remnants of the ventricle drain uh, trajectory over here. So that has nothing to do with the hypoxic ischemic event in this patient. So pitfall two is 
timing of the imaging and pseudo normalization of the ADC map after seven to 10 days. So you can't really rely on your ADC map and you can rely less on your diffusion weighted images if imaging is performed after more than a week. So what to do then? Well, look at your flare because flare might be more subtle early in the disease, but generally the cortical edema will become more clear later in the disease. And we can see on the flare that the cerebral cortex is clearly hyper intense and swollen, and also the basal ganglia are hyper intense, uh, despite the fact that no abnormalities are present on the ADC map. Now, with the flare, you can have the same problem as with your diffusion weighted images. Um, the pathology is perfectly symmetrical, so it can be overlooked. So if you're doubting on whether or not to call something a cortical edema on flare, just pull out a random other patient and compare. And if you compare, you will see that the cortex in this patient is more hyperintent and is thicker compared to this random other patient. And this was a patient with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And this was just a guy who got an MRI because of chronic headaches. And then I can't say that you have to do this in each and every patient. Uh, but in some cases, a gadolinium is administered for other reasons than the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy because yeah, the clinician wants to rule out meningitis or whatever. Um, and in this patient, we also saw gyriform enhancement of the cerebral cortex and enhancement of the basal ganglia, as you can see here. And this means that the blood-brain barrier is disrupted and is something you will see in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy after a couple of days to a week. And you can see enhancement in a gyriform pattern. And this is an extra argument that the basal ganglia and the cerebral cortex are abnormal. Look at this patient. This is also a patient with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. It's very difficult to call the cortex normal or abnormal in this case. Um, I wouldn't really dare uh, say anything, but if you look at the one way the images with gadolinium that were performed for another reason, we clearly see some gyriform enhancement in the uh, pre-central gyrus on both sides, and also here a bit uh, along the uh, superior frontal sulcus, although this probably more reflects some kind of leptomeningeal enhancement. But once again, the T1 weighted images with gadolinium have helped us confirm that the cortex is abnormal, despite the fact that the flare is very dubious uh, to call. Um, this is another example of flare images in a patient with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in the subacute phase. In this case, uh, I think it is clear that the cortex is abnormal. The cortex is very bright on flare images and T2-weighted images. And the French, look at these T2-weighted images. It's, it's almost beautiful, despite the fact that this is actually dramatic for the patient. And in French, there's a very beautiful word for when the cortex looks like this. Uh, let's magnify it a bit. These are the T2-weighted images. These are the flare images. And look at the diffusion and the ADC map. No diffusion restriction uh, present anymore. And this appearance in French is called une image trop belle, which basically means an image that is too beautiful. So when your cortex looks too beautiful to be true, the cortex probably isn't beautiful, but pathological. So the, this was my presentation on hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, uh, or rather imaging of. Uh, what are some of the things I would want you to remember? Um, remember that CT can be negative in the acute phase. So do never rule out hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy based on a negative CT. MRI, on the other hand, a negative MRI rules out hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy with a high degree of certainty. Uh, when you do an MRI, you have to do diffusion-weighted images, of course, before you can make such a statement, because these are the most sensitive sequences for the detection of an acute hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. I have shown you a number of different patterns. So hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy generally affects cerebral cortex and basal ganglia 
but different imaging patterns can be seen. The total cortical pattern is the most frequent one and the one we are most familiar with, but also remember that there exists a watershed pattern, that uh, there exists a basal ganglia only pattern, that sometimes just the periodontal landing cortex and the medial occipital cortex will be involved. And if you do your imaging after, let's say, a couple of days to a week or later, you can have even a white matter pattern. So be aware that these exist. And be very careful when examining a patient who suffered a hypoxic ischemic event, because due to the symmetrical nature of the abnormalities and the perfect symmetry, images can be tricky even for experienced radiologists. So examine your diffusion-weighted images very carefully, correlate with the ADC map. When in doubt, compare with a random other patient, carefully look at your flare images. These two can be very subtle sometimes. So compare and um, do not evaluate these too rapidly. Look carefully and then I'm sure you will pick them out and diagnose them correctly. So thank you very much for uh, watching. Um, this was it for me. More presentations on toxic metabolic diseases will follow. This was just the first one. And if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, you can leave a comment in the comment section, or you can send me an email, neuroradiology.online at gmail.com.